Hello, my name is Michael Rickards, and I'm the Executive Director of the Hall Institute of Public Policy, and this is our policy forum. Today, our guest is William J. Richards, who is our Director of the New Media here at the Hall Institute of Public Policy. The world has changed enormously since the Hall Institute started. We were a simple website, which was new at that time, which now has over 400 entries, past and present. And we've moved into what's called the new media or the social media. Uh, we first did a uh, very well-received virtual debate, one of the first in the country and the first in the history of New Jersey. And we then did other aspects of the so-called social media, including this very show, as well as uh, radio, blog sites, and a variety of new ways of communicating with people. Some are very short and some are much more pro pronounced and long. And so I'm very pleased to be able to talk about those developments with uh, Bill today, but also to talk about an area that both he and I are interested in, and I think many of you are, and that's the future of NASA, the great romance of the person in space. William, welcome. Glad to have you here. Well, great to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, what's happened here to NASA? I went down and I understand, went down to what used to be called Cape Canaveral, Cape Kennedy, and they were celebrating the, the end of the manned space mission. We fought so hard to get somebody up there in the beginning. Why are we fighting now to close it down? Well, I think celebrates a bit strong. Uh, there's, there's a great bittersweet uh, sentiment regarding the end of the, uh, the shuttle program. Um, you got to remember that the previous programs that came before, uh, Mercury, Gemini, they didn't get mourned when they ended because when Mercury ended, Gemini was sitting on the next pad over. When Gemini ended, Apollo was, was ready to take off. There's nothing on the drawing board that's ready to go tomorrow right now. And uh, not only does that mean that America doesn't have any capability to put men and women into space on their on our own, but it also means that uh, on a more personal level for, the, for those folks down there at Cape Canaveral, a lot of people are out of a job. There are an awful lot of people there who are highly educated, the best and, and the brightest of, uh, of their generation who will no longer be working in the space program. Now, when you look at the space program, someone has said to me that if Americans want to go up in space, they're going to have to buy seats on the Russian program? That's is right. That, is that a correct statement or is that just hyperbole? That's right. That, that's the operational plan right now. There are, uh, there are three people in space right now. Uh, there are two Americans and, and, and one Russian. Uh, and I'm sorry, there's, there's six. They're, they were just joined by another, another crew. I, uh, I believe it's, I don't, know the, I don't know the ratios right this moment. But, um, and all of them went up on Russian hardware. They went up on Russian Soyuz capsules. Now, uh, this brought in, uh, in a new unique problem just last, uh, last month, a couple weeks ago. The same rocket that launches these Russian manned capsules, these Soyuz capsules, uh, had a catastrophic failure with an unmanned supply vessel. And Russia has grounded their rockets pending an investigation of what, the, what, what caused the failure. Because it's the same rocket, it's a different capsule, but it's the same rocket. And so until they, they know what the problem is and, and if it's safe, safe to, to resume flights, they're not going to put men up at all. But I remember when the impetus for American participation in the space program was to beat the Russians. Mm -hmm. That was the whole idea. After Sputnik in, 19, in the 1950s, Kennedy made a pledge to the American people that we would be the first that would land on the moon. And it was a what drove us was competition. At that time with the Soviet Union, our mortal enemy, that since has changed. There is no Soviet Union anymore. But what happened to change our, our sense of competition and our also sense of xenophobia? Uh, well, you hit on, on part of it already. They were our mortal enemy. Uh, so they were, they were a, a military adversary. They, they had a completely different way of life. Uh, maybe that was a little bit exaggerated at, at the time, but it was certainly uh, uh, certainly not incorrect to, to say their their social and economic system was radically different than ours. And so, beating them 
uh, was reaffirming the American way of doing things, the Western way of doing things. Uh, that two things happen. One, there's no, no Soviet Union. But even before that, we won. When Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepped foot on the moon in 1969, the world watched. When Apollo 12 landed, just a few short months later, the world almost ignored it. People who were very, very interested in the space program continued, um, but networks weren't even carrying Apollo 13 until the explosion happened on it. Um, that was only two missions after 11. Um, th th we were supposed to be scheduled to, to land up to Apollo 20, but 18, 19, and 20 got canceled. They never went to the moon. Those, uh, those rockets that were supposed to take those, those spacecraft to the moon are sitting in museums right now. They never flew. Um, and so we lost our interest because we won. And uh, so we turned in different directions. Um, we turned towards a more cooperative direction uh, while we still had some of that Apollo hardware with the Apollo Soyuz program where, where we actually, uh, it, was on a, it was a Nixon program uh, to uh, dock an, uh, an American space capsule to a Russian space capsule. And it was, it was a very uh, symbolic moment that some people credit with helping to thaw relations between the uh, America and the Soviet Union. But if in fact um, we are piggybacking on a Russian voyage, then there really there's not going to be much public sentiment for a future that involves manned exploration with large amounts of American dollars. I think there's almost a false premise uh, that, that there is exploration. We haven't done exploration in space since we went to the moon. Um, the space shuttle that was just retired doesn't leave low Earth orbit. This is the same place that, that uh, uh, the Mercury astronauts and the, and, the, and the Gemini astronauts flew in. Um, there's no exploration there. Um, yes, there's some good science going on in the International Space Station, but the Russians are getting there just fine without a big complicated space shuttle. Um, the space shuttle was kind of a political boondoggle. It was overly complex. It never met its, uh, the promises that were made. Uh, for, for being able to, to turn them around and fly a, sp a space shuttle every two weeks. Um, that, that never happened. And so this, this cheap space truck that was going to revolutionize uh, low Earth orbit and, and, and put it within reach for everyone and everything never happened. And there's no exploration going on. So a lot of people are asking the question, why are we putting men and women up into space at all? Well, I want to colonize the moon. We have to get there. If we're not even reaching out to the moon, we're not leaving low Earth orbit, how are we getting to the moon? I want to colonize the moon so that when the Earth destroys itself as a part of Big Bang, that there'll be human life somewhere else in the universe. The, yeah, the, the, the don't put all your eggs in one basket theory. Yeah, well. Yeah. Um, pe people proposed colonies on the moon. People promote, uh, proposed colonies on Mars for that. And there, there are serious pr proposals to do both those things. In fact, there's... Uh, uh, a proposal that NASA is looking at to use lunar colonies as a springboard to Mars. Um, but right now, the people in Washington are more fixated on austerity measures and, and slashing budgets from anything that's not uh, military or insurance, essentially. Now, there's a, a new movie called Apollo 18, mm -hmm. arguing that secretly there was an Apollo mission. And they're the people, I guess, established a colony there. I, I haven't seen the film. Uh, I've been uh, uh, tracking it since it was in production, though, and I, I know a little bit about it. It's it's just taking advantage of the fact the um, the actual historical fact that we did have additional rockets ready to go for Apollo when uh, when the program was canceled, and they said that the reason was canceled wasn't because America lost interest and the Nixon administration wanted to wanted to uh, cut the budget from a program that wasn't popular anymore. But instead, they sent one more mission, and it found aliens and a secret uh, Russian cosmonaut lander that, that uh, had perished before. And that's the reason that the I mission like was classified. Uh, yeah, we're going to have to see that, I guess, <laughs> in that direction. One of the most exciting aspects that's come forward, of course, is we are able, using these incredibly powerful telescopes, 
to not just see the usual things that we saw as a kid, oh my God, there's Mars, but to really go back in time. Absolutely. To go so far back in time that we're, we're, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years. We're actually seeing stars back then. How's that possible? I thought, what, I thought when something was gone, it was gone. It is. Um, when, when we're looking back in time, we're looking at how things were. Those things may not be, any, be there anymore, but the, 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 the gotcha, the, the loophole there, is that light travels at a fixed speed through space, 186,000 miles per second. It goes no faster, no slower ever. And so when we're looking at things that are billions of miles distant, um, light takes time to travel here. Our own sun, we look at that, we think of that as, as, as instant. It's eight minutes away. The light that, that shines on us right now was generated eight minutes ago. Um, you, you sitting here, just, just uh, a couple feet away from me, um, there, there are a few nanoseconds delay between the light I see of you and the light you see of me. Um, and when we're talking about these dramatic, dramatic, vast expanses of, of uh, interstellar, interstellar and intergalactic space, um, you, it can add up to billions of years. What... Uh... We we're looking ma mainly at the uh, um, the older uh, telescope, but there are new, more sophisticated ones now. Mm -hmm. What do they allow us to do? Uh, there are there are evolutions in in uh, there are similar evolutions where you can just do more of the same. You can see further. You can see fainter objects. Then you get to levels where your capabilities allow you to do things that you just couldn't do before. Uh, for instance, there's a revolution right now going on with what are called exoplanets, planets that are orbiting stars that are not our own. Um, I'm not sure when the first exoplanet was discovered, I, I believe it was in the 90s. Before that, we only theorized that there were planets outside our solar system. Uh, then, in the 90s, we began to, to infer that exoplanets existed by the way that stars would wobble, we could tell something was orbiting, orbiting around it. Later, as the instrumentation got better, we were able to actually uh, do what's called uh, uh, a transitive, uh, transitive observation of a star. And the instrumentation is so sensitive that as a planet passes in front of its parent star, that minuscule dip in brightness can be detected by the instruments and, and the, uh, the planets can be observed that way. So, so planets too small to really uh, create a, uh, a large wobble are able to be detected. We are, you and I, on the third planet around the sun. Yes. Which it turns out is really not in the center of the Milky Way, but on the edge. Yes. And the Milky Way in turn is a rather insignificant constellation in the much larger universe that we're a part of. Yes. Should that teach us humility? Uh, ask Ask Galileo. Uh, <laughs> he. Uh, uh, I don't want to go that route. I know, what <laughs> I know what happened to him. I don't want to end up in my living in my house for the rest of my life wearing the the, the medieval equivalent of an ankle bracelet. <laughs> from, from a from a from a stellar from a stellar standpoint, we are average. We are we are mediocre. We are we are a, a, a small planet orbiting a mediocre star in a in an average galaxy, and that doesn't sit well with some people who like to like to think of think of us as as special. Um, but there's I think it was Carl Sagan said there's only two possibilities: either we're alone in the universe. Or we're not. Either possibility is staggering. Okay, if we're alone in the universe, then we are indeed a unique, indeed unique. I was going to say unique species. But that's not even the right word. Mm -hmm. um, if we're not alone, then there are a whole bunch of. We always assume that if we're not alone, the other people are a lot brighter. You know, the Rod Sterling, Rod, Rod Sterling um, ethos, where whenever people come down, they're always brighter and they're looking at. At, at, at Earthlings saying, what fools these guys really are. 
But suppose they're not. Suppose they're really just amoebas. Yeah. Well, the reason for the assumption that they're always brighter is because for a civilization to either travel to another star or communicate with another star, it has to be at least as advanced as, as, as we are right now. We had no prayer of uh, communicating with another star 150 years ago. There wasn't advanced radio communication then. Um, so when, when you're talking about civilizations that are, that are thousands, tens of thousands of years, years old, just to get to radio, just to get to the first invention where you have, have a possibility of, of any kind of interaction with the rest of the universe, um, that means that right now we are at the very baseline, which means by definition anything else that interacts with us Must has, be superior. Has, has to be equal or superior. Um, but, but people who believe that there is life elsewhere believe that, yes, the, there, there are planets that just are still all, all of the things that we see on these magnificent telescopes, I love to look at those pictures. And um, what's his name? Uh, the, the, the physicist from Cambridge, uh, Stephen Hawking. No, Hawking, just did a, 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 a piece on television, two or three part piece on television, where he showed some of these pictures of the universe. But the universe essentially is there. But do we know anything about whether, in fact, there are realities that are tiered much higher, much lower? Uh, not, not tiered, but in fact exist not on this level, but in fact live on parallel levels. Uh, that's more or less the realm of the theoretical physicists, people, yeah. people like Hawking, um, who, because... We're making a lot of assumptions here for this conversation, but, but assuming that, that such things exist, we don't even have a clue how we, would, how we would build an experiment to scientifically observe that and prove its existence. So right now, we're at a lower level. We're just at the math. Um, and that, that, sounds, that sounds hopeless, and that sounds, oh, that, that's just math. But that's how Einstein got relativity. Right. And right now, I got to, I got to this to, to to where I'm I'm sitting right now for this interview with GPS satellites with, with GPS that works on satellites that wouldn't exist without his theory of relativity and 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 the power that's generated here is 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 coming from you know a nuclear plant 20 miles away that that wouldn't exist without his theory of relativity. Um, the math eventually leads to much more concrete things. Do we still believe in the state of cosmology? Do we still believe in Big Bang? Yes, that, yes. That the, the Earth began with a Big Bang. Well, the, the, the universe did. We can, we can, I'm sorry, the universe, all, everything that we know, that we look at, that we see through these microscopes. There's, there's, there's very little question that the universe began at a single point. Because as we observe the universe, we can see it's all spreading out. Everything is moving away from everything else. And so, so they know that at some point everything was together, and it stopped being together and started spreading out. Now, the mathematical models go a little deeper and try to theorize as to, okay, what, is, what does this mean? How, why were they together? And what happened before? But the instant of the Big Bang is pretty much where our ability to even guess stops. And where do we stand in the beginning? There was God? Uh, science doesn't really have a lot to say on that, unfortunately. The, uh, the science, uh, the scientific... That was the original Big Bang. Yeah. The, the, the scientific community either either ignores it, or just generally tends to ignore the question of God. It is. Um, our, our, we've given up on the manned space flights, as we've talked about. Have we given up on the telescopes? Are we letting those be made in the mountains of Switzerland rather than in the mountains of North Carolina? Uh, w believe it or not, a lot of the the selections for telescope locations have to do with uh, more practical concerns can, can than, you, than can, you, can you can see through the exactly exactly you know, uh, uh, Hawaii Chile uh, high altitude so you're looking through less atmosphere and not a lot of pollution and more importantly not a lot of uh, uh, dry climates if you don't get a lot of rain you don't, you don't have a lot of days where it's cloudy you have better observation it's it's not great to build a, uh, uh, a telescope dry, outside it's, Seattle it's or dry in Hawaii. London it's right in Hawaii. Uh, it is. It is above the clouds. As we look at, 
we we tried to put on the whole website uh, the report of NASA about its future, mm -hmm. and I wasn't quite sure that I was terribly inspired by it. But what did you? What did you? What, where do you see us going in the next five years? Everything's ten, up. Ten in, years. Everything's up in the air. Um, there was. There have been two major attempts at a program to, to replace shuttle, um, one and a half maybe. Uh, there was a, a constellation program that, that morphed into something else and now is perilously in jeopardy of becoming nothing. Uh, there's also some proposals for private space flight. Um, SpaceX uh, has been demonstrating to NASA it, it's it's it can flex its muscles and has been putting satellites into orbit for a long time. They now have a, a crewable vehicle that just got... What's the one that's going to allow you to go sell, buy, buy tickets, literally? People to buy tickets like me to that's space. So that's where am I going to end up? That's probably a little bit ways down, down the road, but, but what I was talking about with SpaceX, they have just received permission from NASA to take their, their new capsule, which is still untested, to International Space Station. Which means, for the first time, a commercial entity will be able to put. What's people it going to cost me to get a, a, a seat? It's not open yet. Um, right now, if you're not a space agency or, or something like I that, I really want to do that. It's 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 saying. going to be astronomical for the for the time time being. It's, so that mean over five thousand? Yeah. Uh, if okay. <laughs> the uh, the estimates are something like ten thousand. It costs ten thousand dollars to launch a pound into Earth. So I better lose weight. Lose some weight. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think that it has all sorts of great possibilities. Is it just because this administration isn't interested in space? I don't think that's it. I think this administration is uh, being torn in a lot of different ways. And they're reluctant to make a stand on a program that, unfortunately, the American people don't see as very vital right now. And they are extremely reluctant to be seen as uh, big spending liberals. Well, it's the same problem that Kennedy had, you know, instead of instead of uh, landing a man on the moon, why don't you fix Detroit, hmm. you know? And it's harder for Democrats to deal with that than Republicans who don't really care about what happens to Detroit. If you look at the Clinton, uh, um, if you look at the whole institute here, uh, what do you see uh, us doing and certainly not as dramatic as the types of things you've been talking about, but to move into the next range of media that we're in. I'm watching, for example, as Facebook, which I really don't care for, is, is taking away so much business from some of the what we used to consider some of the newer social media. Hmm. What, uh, what do you see us doing so that we'll be in the forefront? Not... Uh, for sharing technology, but really for the purposes of processing information? Uh, I see our role as working as a bridge between policy policymakers, thinkers, and the, the, the general public. Um, getting the information out there, disseminating it through uh, through new media, through populist channels, through through video productions like this, through um, short things people get on their phone like Twitter, uh, through through Facebook where you can and, and and through and through the web where you can create rich uh, interactive applications to get uh, more detailed information. Um, you What's take, the next Facebook? That's a good question. Google Google is betting it's it's their Google Plus. But uh, so far, things aren't uh, what working. Is Google, as... Plus? Google Plus. If you ask Google, it's nothing like Facebook. If you ask anyone else, it's Facebook that uh, is Google branded. It's uh, it hasn't done a lot to differentiate itself right now, and because all the users are on Facebook, it's got an uphill battle to climb. I don't really care for Facebook myself because I'm not interested in sharing my life with everybody. But uh, there are new software packages that, in a sense, are creating daily autobiographies. Hmm. That is, you would have essentially an autobiography of everything you do every day. I don't know if I want to do that, because <laughs> I see how much of my life I'm wasting, but uh, it's a different approach. We used to think autobiographies were dead, that the only people that wrote, um, that, that had a diary, for example, were old maiden ladies 
because they wanted to remember what they had done when they were young. That's not true anymore. Yeah, pe people don't think of it in terms of a diary. No. But, but yeah, the the the, uh, the surge in social media, first first with blogs and now even with Facebook, has has really become a log of of everything you did going back. Where, 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 where's the American sense of privacy? This is a question that civil libertarians and uh, technologists are, are wrestling with right now. Uh, right now, you've got companies that are screening applicants' Facebook uh, Facebook pages, looking for looking for dirt on potential potential hires. You've got uh, law firms that uh, are, are will specifically look at. Uh, at Facebook and other social media uh, for impropriety, for instance, uh, I know it's child custody cases, things child like that. Child custody, wow. Um, there, was a, there was a case in the, uh, I think it was the Asbury Park Press uh, last month about a father who had custody of his daughter uh, on, on weekends or, or shared custody, something like that, um, took her on a trip to Bush Gardens in Virginia yeah. and uh, wasn't supposed to take her out of the state. Uh, the attorney for the mother found out through through Facebook, and uh, wow, yeah. Well, thank you very much. We've had an exciting and interesting conversation with uh, William Richards, who works for the Hall Institute, about where we're going in the future, and also where the future is going in terms of space travel. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Thanks for having me.